right. Well, good morning. It is the 50th of March, <laughs> and we are continuing on with the longest month and spring break in the, spring break in the history of uh, ever. So um, things are looking up, though. It looks like April is going to start soon. Maybe by next week, we'll actually move into the month of April, and we're excited for that. Um, and uh, other things, but let's go into prayer. We're going to continue with the promises of God uh, as as we get ready to. We see there's there's light at the end of the tunnel. We have a finish line ahead of us um, where we're going to get back to a little bit of normalcy, normality. Which one is the state of normal? The other is fact of normal. So they both work right there, both words. So we're just gonna we're gonna say normality uh, as we come back into it. Hopefully, we haven't gotten so. Um, complacent in that time or lazy in that time that we would rather just do what we've been doing versus look at the things we've taken for granted and and run for them head first and that's what I'm praying we do as a country whether that be work or church or family or whatever so let's pray and let's get started this morning uh give us a like or a thumbs up if you're on Facebook comment whatever let us know you're there uh, let us know you're watching as we get into service this morning Father God we love you and adore you we thank you for another day Father we thank you for an end in sight that that um, things are going to go back uh, that we're coming out of this thing at this time but Hopefully we've used it as a time of reflection and a time of encouragement, Lord. Um, and if there's things that we still have that we need to put together that we were to use this time for, may it be revealed to us what it is and get to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wherever you are this morning, if you'd stand up and worship with us. I've searched the world. Nothing. 
walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to feel the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life.
shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Sing it out. to the words in this bridge. It is so powerful that you are speaking over generations that have not even been thought about yet. Just sing it out this morning with everything that you have. The words are up on the screen. You might not know it well. But sing it from your heart. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations, your family, and your children, and their children, and their children, may his favor be upon you, and a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children, may his presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you, all around
on. We have another, we have more worship to go into, but I want to read two scriptures to you real fast, wherever you are, because we've been, we've been going on this, this, this theme of the promises of God during this, this quarantine, during this crisis, during whatever you want to call it. Uh, we've, been, we've been leaning on the promises of God. We've been learning and digging apart and breaking into the promises of God. And they all have to deal with the same thing over and over and over again. It's hope, it's hope, it's hope. And I read these scriptures last night and I shared them on Facebook, but I want to share them today. But before, I'm going to share James 4, 17. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. So Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we profess, the hope that we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. And if we've already learned that the Lord is faithful, and we've already learned that a righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from all. And we, we know that he can be trusted with that promise. We need to hold tightly to that, unwaveringly to that, as we profess it to other people. We need to show it in the way that we walk, in the way we talk, in the way we act. Not show just worry, fear, and concern, but show hope that the Lord delivers. He delivers all, that the Lord is faithful. And Ephesians 1.18 says that I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope that he has given to those he called. His holy people who are rich and glorious, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. We are a glorious I mean, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. In all your drunk, in all your troubles, in all your issues, whoops, we are called his rich and glorious inheritance. So wherever you are, I want you to claim those two promises. We're going to go over another one today, but I want you to claim the Lord is faithful and the Lord delivers all. Wherever, whatever it is, it doesn't even have to be about this virus. It can be about something totally, totally unrelated. But the Lord is faithful and he delivers us from all. And we rest assured unwaveringly, unwaveringly in that confident hope that we are his and we can trust his promise. Amen.
Father God, wherever we are right now, anoint our hearts and our minds and our ears to receive your word, to receive transformation and insight and truth today, to transform a little bit more than we did last week and a little bit more next week than we do this week, and just to continue to grow and grow and grow in you. Father, that we will, we will see and, and gain and hold on to and grab on to more and more and more hope right now. And for those that are hopeless, that don't know you, that don't have a personal relationship with you, God, may they see a sermon somewhere, a message somewhere, a worship team somewhere that pops up on their feed and allow your Holy Spirit to start instilling hope, your hope in them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. I didn't get my Jalen nod. I had to get it from somebody else, so I think I'm right. <laughs> Good morning. Like I said, it's the 50th of March. We're going to continue with that until, we, uh, until we're unshackled, freed by the world. Um, I, there's a couple things I did want to announce first. I want to give our... Uh, tithe and offering information. We have the um, ways for you to do text to give as well as our, you can download the, the LifeGate app from Tithely and give through there, number 936-277-1640, um, or download our app, search for LifeGate Lufkin. It's got our little logo and symbol on there, and it's uh, easy to do from that area too, as well as our, our sermons are downloaded, audio sermons are downloaded every week onto that app. Um, we're getting better with announcements on it. There's a lot of different platforms to announce stuff on, so it's like each one needs a person. Um, also, we have, do we have our um, Text in Church page? Throw it up there for me. All right, so if you're a first-time guest or your first-time first time watcher, um, that's a, this is the number you'll text the word welcome to 936-218-2658. If you're a new believer, you text the word kingdom, and it gives us the ability to text back and forth with you um, and, and gives us like a, a workflow chart to help you through some beginning steps of who we are and your walk with Christ. Um, other than that, I have one big, big prayer request that was given to me, and it's a lady named Amy that has volunteered to go to New York as a nurse and work a 21-day shift in the middle of their ground zero area of this uh, virus right now. Um, she was very open. Her, her, mother, uh, uh, her, her mother goes to church here, was baptized here, and um, she's asked me to pray as well, asked us to pray as well. Um, but she said she's not worried about this virus. She'll be okay. She just wants to go help people right now. She wants to be where, they, where she's needed, so that's what she's done. Um, also, we have this thing, there's a lot of seniors that, as parents, most of us probably knew that the school year was over, but a lot of the kids found out officially this week that the school year is over. For seniors, that's tough. For all kids, that's tough. I mean, I know they don't like school. I mean, I can't imagine being given a multiple-month spring break when I was in school. I'd have been working to death is what had been happening, but anyway... Um, but I see the things that they're missing. So someone has come up. My wife has more information, but I will help as much as I can. It's called Adopt a Senior. And it's on different Facebook pages. You can find it. I, I, if you're in Angelina County, I ask that you stick with Angelina County. But it basically allows you to adopt one of these kids. Not really, but maybe. Um, it allows you to adopt one of these kids and either send them a card or a gift or a monetary gift or whatever just to tell them, Hey, you know, congratulations, because God honors completion. God honors completion. Um, there's, there's not a single person. Well, I say that. There's typically in high school, there is some time when you just want to give up. That's it. I'm out of here. I'd ra especially for guys that are workers, I'd rather go to work. Um, some of us have the fear of the Lord and our fathers, and so we didn't do that. Some people didn't have that. Um, so... God honors completion. People go back and get their GED. God honors that. People go to college and they complete. He honors it. But it usually has some sort of ceremony that goes with it. And 
right now that's unavailable. So someone's come up with this idea, I think nationwide, is that right? Okay, we, we know it's Angelina Countywide, at least. So if you have a senior, put your senior on there. Let someone bless them. And, and it doesn't have to be monetary. It could be something little, but I, I'm not sure what the rules really are. I just know it's like a... Yeah, if you don't have... I'm saying if you have a senior, put them on there. If you don't have a senior, look into it. Tell someone you're proud of what they did. Tell someone you're, you're, you're happy uh, that they completed and keep moving forward because... I'm one of those people that took a year off from school. Between high school and college, I took a year off. That year has lasted since 1999. And the product is now staying in my home because he can't be at college. Love him to death. Uh, (laughs) So think about that for all these seniors right now that had plans to go. He actually told me, I'm thinking about taking some time. No, you're not. You are not taking time off between college and high school you're going. <laughs> learn, son, learn. Uh, but they have this time of complacency right now that there's a lot of kids struggling to go to college. This, this might be the thing that pushes them to not go. I'm not saying they have to. Vocational school, trade school, whatever they're going into, this may push them a different direction. So we want to, as a Christian community, as an East Texas community, Stand behind them, put our shoulder in their backs, and push them forward. So I urge you to go on there. Um, on top of that, our uh, our team members that, that make this work every week uh, have been amazing this past month or, or three years or however long it's been that we've been quarantined. Um, from our worship team to our sound and media team to our pastoral team and, and our board and on and on and on, um, Pastor, Pastor Manny and Pastor Chris are putting stuff out constantly for the kids to do uh, online or Facebook in different ways. Pastor Kristen and Sister Megan are working constantly with the kids, the youth, trying to get them involved and keep them involved. So I really, really appreciate their hard work during all of this because we're all trying to figure out new ways to do stuff right now. Um, we had to plan. We have plans. We're planning things. Um, that's really what today is about, is the plan for you, that God has a plan for you. I have a plan for you. Now, I know there's going to be people that roll their eyes already because you know where I'm going. That's okay. Um, If you know me, you know that I hate scheduling. I loathe it. Can't stand it because it puts me in a box. Now I have to end this at this time, and I must start this at this time. And what if I wanted to do this for five more minutes? What if I didn't want to cook till 7 o'clock? That don't really work very well in my household. It happens, but it's not easy, right? She's an eat early person, not an eat late. She's a scheduler. I'm not. But I love strategic planning. There's a difference. I think there's a huge difference. Um, Doing construction, residential construction, my favorite part of, of building or remodeling. I'm watching that face. I see that. Uh-huh. I, yeah. My wife is here, of course, so she's part of the essential team, and I, I did not see a happy face. So anyway, my favorite part of building, remodeling is the planning part. When you really get down to what, how you're going to start the project, what you're going to use, what, you're going to, what it's going to look like, what the design's going to be, it's the planning that goes into it. I enjoy figuring out where rooms are going to go, where new bathrooms are going to go, or trim, or what we're going to use for doors. I like that. Recently, we got to talk as a church about some major changes we were going to do to the campus that we thought was going to start May 1st, but we still haven't made it out of March yet, so... Once we make it out of March, we'll see. But, but I, I like that. that. The stuff that we talked about changing here, we have been planning on for over a year, some stuff over three years, some stuff beyond that. I like that part. I enjoy that kind of thinking. I like planning big events. I like planning series-type things, praying and thinking about them, throwing out ideas to other people, brainstorming different ways to communicate biblical truth to today's world. I like it. But even with planning and lots of planning, there's still a degree of uncertainty. If you look at blueprints, it's got all the planning in the world on it, 
but you still don't know what the building's going to look like until it gets built. Until it's, the structure is up and it's there, you don't really know what it's going to look like. You plan for a big day like in ministry or a big service or a family day, but you don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. Someone could get sick and miss service. That's a key part of what you're doing. I could say the wrong thing. I've never done that before. Um, the Lord could direct us in an entirely different uh, area, and we don't, don't even get to do the things we planned because guess what? He, he reserves the right to do that. He reserves the right to change our plans. Um, he has the right to interrupt us. It's his house. It's his service. Sister Lena is this planner and, and scheduler. And then Pastor Chris came to be part of the children's ministry and Pastor Mandy with him, and so is she. Yeah, Pastor Chris, not so much. I, you want to take the kids to the zoo? Yeah, let's get a bus and get some kids. Where are we going? Don't know. Where are we going to stop for gas? But let's see. Are we going to eat somewhere if we get hungry? No. Not with the ladies. The ladies are going to have it planned out where, where we're getting gas, where we're stopping to eat, where the bathroom break is going to be, which kids are going first. to the bathroom. I mean, it's going to be fully planned. They're going to research things. They're going to talk to people. They're going to write it out. They're going to scribble it. Then they're going to write it out again. They're going to throw it away. They're going to study before they ever make a final decision on something. I like to wing it, sort of. On some things, most things, most, I can't say some things, most things. But either way, whether you're a strategic planner or a strategic scheduler or whatever, it's awesome when plans come together. When everything works out perfectly, it's a great feeling when all your hard work and your effort and your thinking and your praying and your brainstorming and your studying produces a victory or what you consider a victory. It's not so awesome when your plans don't work out. It's not that cool. Um, I don't enjoy failure. I don't think anyone does. I don't loathe failure. I don't shun failure. I think it's failure allows growth. Failure allows us to fix the things that we should have done different the first time. I don't think failure is an end all, but I don't enjoy it. Over the years, we have made some awesome mistakes as a ministry, as a church. We just had, there were some things that we thought were going to be really, really cool, and they really weren't. There were some speakers we thought would just be really great, and they really weren't. There were some songs that I just thought would take service over the top, and they flopped. There's a Christmas one I'll never share again because the whole team looked at me and said, are you nuts? And I was. I just happened to be in a mood for whatever that song was that day. We didn't need to do it. I um, <laughs> don't even remember what it is, but there's ministries that we thought, like, like extra ministries that we thought would be perfect for who we are that didn't work out at all. We've had some mistakes. And when an idea for a service or a ministry or building or a detail is missed, it's embarrassing, it can be sad, but it's not a catastrophe. It's growth, it's moving forward. Mistakes happen, not every plan works out. Our culture at LifeGate and my personal ministry all the way back to Teen Challenge has always been, we don't try to hide every mistake. We don't try to hide mistakes. Um, we acknowledge mistakes. We let people know, hey, that didn't work out. We're not going to do it again. We have a motto that I'll, I'll just leave on the table, but it, it's a motto that we use uh, with our team. Uh, and because I believe if, if, if I'm supposed to help lead people and train people to make it past their failures and their mistakes, then they need to see mine. If I show you false perfection, then what are you going to do when you mess up? Oh, I don't, I'm never going to add up to that. We're, that that's so, so we try to show our mistakes and acknowledge them. It's still not easy when plans for life don't work out, though. When everything you thought could be and should be and wouldn't be all of a sudden isn't, won't be, and doesn't look like it'll ever be. As a student, a young adult, a kid, you make plans and you imagine what your life's going to be like. You imagine what kind of job you're going to have, how much money you're going to make, what kind of car you're going to drive. If you're a dude, you probably had a poster in your room with the car that you were going to have. Then you found out it's $300,000, and you can't make that building houses right away, ever, maybe. <laughs> 
whether or not you're going to be married, how many kids you're going to have, where you're going to live. We make these plans, and then you make plans that probably include things like the kind of impact you're going to make on people, what, the difference, what kind of difference you're going to try to make, things you're going to do and things you're never going to do, and you say things like this. This may sound familiar. I will never be like my father. Okay. I'll never be an addict. I'll never overdose. I'll never be an alcoholic. I'll never be divorced. I'll never cheat on my spouse. I'll never be homeless. I'll never go to prison. I will never. I have fulfilled most of those. I have, I have said them all and fulfilled most of them in my past. One of life's biggest challenges is how do you handle it when your plans don't work out, when your I nevers become a truly, when your I nevers become an absolute, when they become a now, how do you handle it? When you aren't what you thought you would be, and you aren't doing what you thought you would do, it's difficult to move forward. You're not what you plan to be, and instead you seem to be everything that you nevered. I will never, and now I'm everything I wasn't going to be. What happens is people tend to lose heart when their plans don't work out. People lose heart. People walk away from God. They walk away from church. They walk away from all the people who love them and have their best interests at heart. And often we even blame God. We blame God as it's God's fault that our plans didn't work. Others that have never been part of a church, never really had God in their life, they don't understand why. Why do I hurt so much? Why does it hurt when I fail? Why did I fail? Why didn't my plan work out? You don't plan to be a failure. Nobody plans to be a failure. Okay? You don't plan to be an alcoholic or an addict. You don't plan to be bitter and angry. N nobody does. You don't plan to fail a class and lose your scholarship. You don't plan to get cancer. You don't plan to be alone. You don't plan for your kids to be messed up. You don't plan to be disappointed you don't plan for your plans to fail. Nobody does. That's where we find the Israelites. We're picking up on where we were last week. That was not planned, it just happened. Picking up on where we were, that's where the Israelites find themselves in the passage we're going to look at today. So I'm going to set it up again for you, okay? You got the Israelites, obviously. They lose the battle. They suffered many losses. The survivors are captured by King Nebuchadnezzar, and then they're taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. All the survivors are taken from Jerusalem to Babylon, or the group of. They weren't free and living right now. They were defeated, disappointed, discouraged. Nothing they planned was working out. Hmm. And it's a sad group of people. God had given them a promised land, but now the promised land wasn't where they were. It was in the hands of the enemy all of a sudden. And they're not living in God's blessing. Instead, they're captured slaves in another country. They're political prisoners held by a cruel enemy who had no plan to ever let them leave or go back home. To make it even worse, the reason God allowed them, God allowed them to be captured was their disobedience. Their disobedience is why God allowed them to be captured. This is about hope. I'll, I'll get there, though. The Israelites knew God, and they knew his power. They weren't ignorant about his laws and his plans, but they decided to do their own thing, something we use all the time in Christian lingo, doing it in your own strength, doing your own thing. They weren't ignorant to what God wanted, but they decided to do their own thing. They disobeyed God by worshiping idols. They, they made deals with the enemy they entered into pacts and agreements with kings and kingdoms to ensure their safety instead of trusting God for protection. And on top of that, they were warned by prophets, warned time and time again on multiple occasions. They ignored them all and kept doing their own thing. Their plan didn't work out because it was exactly that. It was their plan, not God's. Now, even in our walk, we have a lot of plans that end up being our plan. We think it's a godly plan. As pastors, you, my vision, you heard my vision before, my vision, my vision is a really, sometimes it's a cover-up for my plan. I'm very careful about using the word vision 
here because I don't want it to be a justification for my plan. I want it to be God's plan. So I'm careful with it. We do this. We, we, we tend to make plans ourselves and not realize they're not God's plan. So finally, what's God do? He's like, okay. Same thing he did when they wanted a king. They wanted a king so bad. All right, fine. You want a king? That's not the way it should be. I'm your king, but I'll give you one. Same thing happens here. All right, you want to do it your way? Cool. Keep pushing? All right. Tell you what. I'll remove my hand. I'll remove my protection. I'll remove my plans. And I'll let you experience the victories and the consequences of following your plan instead of mine. Maybe you're there. Maybe you're in the same situation. You knew right, but you didn't do right. You ignored the warnings, and you decided to do your own thing. Instead of God's plan, you did yours. And now you realize all my choices, all my decisions have led me to a place where I am not anywhere near God's plan. I'm not anywhere near where I'm supposed to be in God. I'm not anywhere near. My plan ended up in something that I never planned to be. Maybe that's you. That's where the Israelites were in this story. They realized, man, that's an epic failure. We have messed up. Our plan didn't work out at all. Sure wish we would listen to God a little bit. And they wondered, is there a way back? Are we going to be captives forever? Can we get back into God's plan? Is there any hope for us? Is there still a place in God's plan for us? Maybe you're in the same position. Have I wandered off too far? Have I gone too far? I'm so far off. Oh, I'm playing the part. I'm doing my part. I look like I'm doing, but I'm so far off. Is there any way back? Is there any hope? Is there still place for me in God's plan? Is that calling still applying to my life? Does God still have any kind of plan for me? Hey, hush, Siri. Okay. Did y'all pick that up on camera? Because it was loud up here. She didn't get it. I got to watch what I say because Siri will pick up or Alexa will pick up when I'm preaching. And that's maybe it's time for a different watch on stage. Fair enough. Okay. Ministry expense. No. (laughs) No. Israelites are hopeless at this point. Kind of like this watch. Hopeless. It'll talk to you but never do the things you need it to do. Tell you you're working out when you're talking on the phone. I just walk. Okay. They're hopeless, they're helpless, they're powerless, they're defeated. Their plan led to this. And then they get a letter, okay? You ever been looking for a letter and you get the letter and you're so excited because it's a letter and you turn the letter over and you see who it's from and now you're not excited anymore because it's the wrong one? You know what I'm talking about. You've been waiting on that stimulus and all of a sudden you got a bill. You know what I'm talking about. Better be tithing on it. Anyway, um, Look, it's in the mail. No, it's a double electric bill because we're all at home right now. They get a letter. They're excited because they get a letter. All of a sudden, they're not excited anymore when they see who the author is, who the writer is. It's a prophet named Jeremiah. They didn't like Jeremiah too much. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. He was a gloomy guy. He didn't usually have a whole lot of encouraging things to say. Matter of fact, they even barely much tortured him over him giving them God's word. They wanted to hear something encouraging. Give us good news. Tell us our plan is going to work. Tell us we're in God's good graces. Tell us we're in his plan. And when he would not do that, when he wouldn't lie, they tortured him some more. They bring him back up from this little cesspool pit and tell us what we want to hear. Lie to us. Oh, prophet, lie to us. Preacher, lie to us. Pastor, lie to us. Do anything but tell us the truth. I just want to feel good. Sounds like, sounds like church today. Sounds like the church culture in America. Just lie to us. Lie to me. Please don't tell me I'm in sin. Find different ways to tell me I'm not. Make me feel good. I get this letter. He's not the guy you want to get a letter from when you're held captive. And like most of Jeremiah's words, it starts off fairly rough. We're not going to this scripture right now, but when he, after the introduction of who he's writing it to and from and who it's sent by and everything, like the fifth verse, it says, build houses, prepare to stay. (laughs) That's the start of the letter. 
They're looking for hope. He says, build homes, prepare to stay. You know, build families because you're going to be here for a minute. So this is, <laughs> doesn't start out really happy. We're going to jump to verse 10, Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Um, and it says, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon. What? 70 years? Dude, people reading this letter, most of them are going to be dead by the time that's up. What do you mean 70 years? 70 years. Three generations are going to be born in 70 years. They're not even going to know what home is like at this point. And you read that and you think, okay, disobedience and sin lead to this captivity. Pastor, is it going to take me 70 years? Is this going on for 70 years? Is that the price for disobedience? I'm not even going to be alive. There's not a whole lot of hope in that. And you said you were preaching on hope. Why 70 years? The Bible doesn't make it clear. It does not make it clear why 70 years. We could go into numerology and all that, but I'm, I'm not doing that. What I think is the Israelites were being judged for long-term generational disobedience, long-term generational disobedience that warranted a long-term punishment. I was removed from my family for two years. Okay. It, my actions warranted long-term punishment and correction and discipline from God. So why 70? Maybe that's how long it took them to actually figure out that they needed to follow God's plan instead of their own. Because it takes us a while, does it not? In all our own strength and all our own goodness, we try to do things on our own, and it takes us a while to figure it out. We're talking about an entire nation here that had to figure it out together. Maybe it took them that long to realize that their plans are foolish, and the only right path is to completely trust and rely on God. Maybe that's how long it took them to come to their senses. This is just speculation at this point, but it's fun to speculate. Why 70? Well, I got some advice for you. Don't wait 70 years. Some of you ain't got that kind of time. I ain't got that kind of time. Don't wait 70 years, don't, don't, wait, don't wait seven years, don't wait seven minutes for that matter. If, if your plan hasn't worked thus far, it's not going to just magically start working tomorrow. If your plan has failed and it's not working out, all of a sudden it's not going to start working. It's just going to get you deeper and deeper and deeper into this mess that you're in right now. So decide now, before I start the message, okay, I'm done. I'm done God, I am ready. I'm ready right now. I'm ready for your plan. Years ago, sitting in, in, a, in a county, Hilton, uh, I had a former mentor of mine. Re, he wrote me a letter, and it says, sometimes you just need to say, okay, God, I'm ready. And when I finally let my pride down enough to do that is when things started to move for me. Maybe today's your day. Okay, God, I'm ready. I'm ready right now. I'm ready for your plan. It's not going to be easy, but I'm going to do it. So he says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and I'll fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. So God was saying, when 70 years are up, your time in captivity will be over and you will return to Jerusalem. And if you've been in church for a very long time, you have heard this next verse Quite a bit, I'm sure, that it, it is the promise we're going to look at today. I purposely stay away from it because it's done so much. And then I started to realize that's my walk. It was my studies and my teachings that was, this was pushed on me a lot. And because I've been pastoring here for quite a while, it hasn't been used that much. And it's a promise we need to stand on. So you've heard it. It's familiar. You probably haven't studied it in context but you've heard it. If you're not a church person and you're suffering from doing things your own way and your own plan, this promise is going to be huge for you. There I go with the presidential thing again. Huge, it's great, it's magnificent, it's awesome. I just can't do the, can't do the accent. Anyway, so 11 starts off like this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Okay. I know there are two awesome things right there in that part of the verse already. First, first thing, God still has a plan for you. 
No matter how messed up you are, no matter how far you've wandered off course, no matter what you've done, where you've been, who you've been around, God still has a plan for you. And second, God knows the plan. He knows the plan. He's not making it up as he goes along. God has always had a plan and will always have a plan for you. The moment you decide I'm ready, he already has it in place. It's already ready to go. So I guess the meat is going to be what takes us away from God's plan in the first place. What, what's taking us? Well, we're good Christian people, right? We go to church, we tithe, we raise our hands in worship. We don't do things that are too far out the box. We're, we're good. What takes us out of God's plan? The same thing that took the Israelites out of his plan. First thing would be sin. You know what's right, but you choose to do wrong. You choose to violate God's word and instructions. And then there would be disobedience. With sin, you do wrong. I know this is kind of confusing, but with disobedience, you don't do right. Just chew on it, I guess, for a second. You know the right thing to do. Okay, with disobedience, you know the right thing to do, but you choose not to do it. And then you act surprised when you find yourself suffering the consequences of doing this or not doing this, of being disobedient. If you disobey God's instructions regarding your finances, guess what? There's going to be consequences. You disobey his instructions regarding relationships, consequences. Disregard regarding habits, consequences. How about even in the Bible, he's got got instructions for conflict resolution. Disregard them, there's going to be consequences. There's a clear pattern in Scripture And it is, sin and disobedience always lead to captivity. Sin and disobedience will always lead to captivity. I'm not saying that you're going to be captured by an enemy. But you will be controlled by something that is not you. For some of us, it's a little bit more real because it's real captivity. Because it's real to get our attention, God has to capture us and settle us down. But you will be controlled by something that is not yourself. Every addict in the world understands this. Being controlled by something outside of you, ruled by the desire for the next drink, the next pill, or the next person, and captivated by that desire. Now, you're thinking pills and alcohol and all How about this? There's some of you that are controlled by your debt. You're captive to your debt. You are captive to your debt. Your debt owns you. Others are captive by an attitude. That way of thinking owns and controls you. It could be an attitude of fear, resentment, worry, and it is becoming who you are. Satan's agenda, point blank, is to always have you trapped. His agenda is to trap the child of God. He wants you to be held captive by sin. He doesn't want you to experience the freedom that God has for you. His agenda is to trap you. And he's got plenty, plenty of tools to captivate you. Another thing that takes us away is self-reliance. Self-reliance takes us away from God's plan. This is the Israelites that decided we are the great and mighty Israel. Look how long we have stood We can handle things just fine. We don't need God's plan right now. When you rely on yourself instead of God, get off plan. You will never accomplish God's plan for your life in your own power. If you can accomplish the plan that you have in your own power, it's not God's. You get away from God's plan when you listen to the wrong people. The Israelites listened to other kings and other advisors who led them straight into captivity and defeat. Students, young adults, kids, this is why your parents and your pastors and your teachers are so concerned about the people in your life, who you're talking to and who you're listening to. Who are your friends? Who do you hang out with? The Apostle Paul wrote that that bad company corrupts good morals. He was right. So then you have to check yourself. Is it my morals being corrupted by bad company or have I become the bad company corrupting someone's morals? 
You get away from God's plan when you listen to the wrong people and you ignore the right people. The Israelites ignored multiple warnings of God through his prophets. And when you do that, when you ignore warnings, when you ignore instructions from people who love you and have your best interest at heart, guess what? Guess whose plan you're getting off of? God's. We're just like the Israelites, aren't we? If you really think about it, we're just like the Israelites. We want what we want when we want it, we want it our way. As a nation, we want what we want when we want it, we want it our way. With who we want it, no matter what, and then we act surprised when it doesn't work out. How did this happen? But being disciplined by God is not being abandoned by God. It's not the same thing. In the middle of all the mess, God says this in 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And what we expect God to say, because we are self-condemning people, as humans, we are self-condemning people, we expect God to be who we are. We expect him to be angry. We expect him to be a, a um, fool me once, shame on. I'm not even going to try to mess that up, because ever since um, two, presidents messed it, two presidents ago messed it up, I can't get it right. Uh, thank you, George W. But <laughs> we expect God to act the way we would. So this is what we expect from this right here. We expect to hear, I know the plans I have for you, you miserable, disobedient, stubborn, foolish, know-it-all people. Here's my plan for you, nothing, nothing. You ignored me, you disobeyed me once, why would I have a plan for you now? That's what we expect. That's what we throw on top of ourselves. That's what we throw on top of other people because we're not good at grace sometimes. But instead, God says this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. That's an amazing and an awesome promise, and it's a verse that is taken out of context far too often. And I will get to that. The situation is this. This is what God said to a foolish, disobedient people who were far from his plan. I still have a plan for you. I still got you. This season is not going to last forever. It's going to end. You will be free. You will be delivered. I am still here. And in the middle of a difficult time, God still has a plan for you. It doesn't mean your life is going to be filled with only good things. There will be trials. Your life may be challenging and tough, especially following his plan sometimes because Satan doesn't want you on it. You may be going through a difficult season. God's good. He's never going to abandon you. When you come back, I need this job. Uh, we are getting it down, people. I thought she was leaving the room. We are getting this ministry church preaching thing down. Yeah, see, you're not here to see how good it is, but that, like, I didn't even have to cure. I started to cure because I thought she was leaving. My word, best team ever. <laughs> Let the Holy Spirit back in. God's going to deliver us from this. He's going to deliver you from the situation you're in. And that's what this whole thing is about. Is I've been sitting at home, and it was great at first because 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 it wasn't great at first. But then you settled in, and like it's going to be great. I got some time at home to do stuff. And then you settled in so much, you settled into self-loathing. And you've been in the same pajamas for four weeks. And you're looking at yourself in the mirror just with a potato chip hanging out your hair and going, I can't stand my life right now. God is still here. He's got you. It's a difficult season, but he won't abandon you. And when difficulty comes into your life, it's not a sign. It's not a sign that God is lost or confused or doesn't have a plan for you. Don't ever buy into that. Difficult seasons come with the will of God sometimes. They're part of the deal. There are, there are things we could, because of our own tendency, roadblocks that we're going to have to figure out a detour route to get stay on the plan. The enemy's going to throw potholes in that road for us to try to hurt us, to try to knock the tire off the rim, whatever you want, whatever analogy you want right there. There you go. 
But it doesn't mean that God is lost, God is confused, or doesn't have a plan for you when difficulty arises. God's plan is to prosper you. Now, before all the people get off because they think I'm about to prosperity preach them, let me fix this scripture that is so taken out of context by so many people. I want to help you with that word right there, prosper. It's been taken to mean that God has a plan to make me rich. It's been used to mean that God has a plan for me to have a big home and a nice car and big jet for my new ministry and and great big shopping sprees. It's been used for that, but it's a bad translation. And therefore, we're taking God's word and we're tearing it apart and we're trying to make it fit our and justify our lifestyles. The word that God used here wasn't really talking about money or possessions. The word that we interpreted as prosper right here is the word shalom because the context it was used in. But shalom as its root as a a Hebrew word means peace. Shalom is being at rest and at peace in the middle of adversity, in the middle of your season right now. That's shalom. Shalom is God with you in the middle of your trouble. Shalom shalom is well-being and satisfaction no matter what's going on. So you could read it more accurately in today's language if you read this. I have a plan for you. Give you peace to take care of you and to watch out for you. I'm not changing God's word, but I'm not going to take it out of context and tell you it's to make you rich. It's that right there. I have a plan for you, and it's to give you peace. It's to take care of you, and it's to watch out for you. It's to be the father that I am. God isn't looking to punish you for the rest of your life or to make you miserable for your sin and your disobedience. His plan is to take care of you and not to harm you. But that's not all of it. There's a little bit more. There's a little bit more of this scripture. Go ahead and give it to me. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope, plans to give you hope, plans to give you hope. God says my plan for you also includes hope. It's not just peace, but it's hope as well. I got plans for you. And you're not my puppet. That's not what I'm saying. But my plans are to make your life everything you as a child stood there and said, I'm going to be. I'm going to be this. I'm going to do this. I won't do this. I won't do that. And that's God's plan spoken through the heart of a child of what they will be. And that's what he's trying to tell you he has for you. Hope, peace, and hope is involved in my plan. Hope, I got a definition for hope right there. It's the anticipation of a better tomorrow. If there's any time that a people could anticipate a better tomorrow, it's now. There is a better tomorrow arising, a better church arising out of this, a better country arising out of this, a community and a people. Or we can get caught up in all the hype and all the junk and all the wondering of what if, or we can just be better. Hope isn't a lightning bolt that is just struck upon you. It is a gift from God that you must latch on to and choose to take for yourself. Just like peace, I choose peace and I choose hope and I choose to grab onto it. I choose to take it as the jawbone. Just (laughs) the jawbone falls at his feet. It didn't fall in his hand. Slew the thousands of, of, of the enemies with the jawbone, a gift from God, basically, but it wasn't laid in his hand. It was laid upon the ground. He had to bend down and pick it up to receive his mantle, his weapon, his gift. Hope and peace are the same thing. You have to choose to bend down and grab them. Hope is the anticipation of a better tomorrow. Better days are ahead. The end is in sight. You're not always going to be in this condition. My plan offers hope. Listen, if you're currently out of God's plan, and you know it, I don't care how Christian and righteous you are, I don't care how saintly you are, if you are out of God's plan and you know it, He still has plans for you. Not to harm you, but to take care of you. 
to get your hopes up that things are going to get better, God gives hope. There's a school system, a very large city, that this would come in handy right now, but this school system has a program to help children keep up with their schoolwork when disaster strikes, like in, if they're injured in the hospital. Those that are teachers probably understand this. Kids that are in the hospital fall behind. So this program allows these, these kids that are in the hospital, city hospitals, to keep up with their schoolwork. And there, there's a teacher. It's not the teacher. It's in, like a substitute teacher that's assigned to the hospitalized kid, hospital, kids in hospitalization. And one day this teacher goes in to teach this boy she had never met, to visit the child. She took the child's name, gets the room number, talks to the child teacher for a little bit. Teacher says, we're studying nouns. We're studying nouns and adverbs right now. I'd be grateful if you could help him understand those. So the hospital program teacher goes to the hospital. No one mentioned that this boy had been badly burned head to toe. That he was in constant pain, that he was hurting, that Statistically, he wasn't going to make it anyway. No one mentioned that. But she gets there. She's upset when she sees the boy, visibly upset. And, but she pulls herself together and she says, I've been sent by the school to help you with nouns and adverbs. And she left and didn't feel like she had accomplished anything because you really can't get through right now. He's in so much pain. The next day, she goes back and a nurse asks her, what? did you say to that kid? She's worried. She's upset. She thought she had done something wrong. She said, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. She said, no, 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 no. Nothing's wrong. I need to know what you said to that child. We've been worried about that boy, his will to live, the pain he's under, everything. But ever since yesterday, his whole attitude has changed. He's fighting back. He's responding to treatment. It's like he decided to live. And that's all you get of the story until two weeks later when he's healed and when he's a lot better and able to talk more. This is what the boy says. He had completely given up hope, was ready to die until the teacher arrived because he just knew he was going to die until the teacher arrived. Everything changed when he came to this one realization. Remember perspective? We talked about perspective a couple weeks ago. Perspective. He said it this way. They wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs with a dying boy, would they? So I knew I was going to make it. Hope in little things that we do makes big differences in people. Hope right now. People are dying right now. And I'm seeing, I mean, they are spiritually dying right now. Hope. I find it fascinating that people focus on the plan and prosper but they miss the hope and the future part. They love the plan and prosper, but the hope and future is what gets you to that and what gets you through it. There's very little that's given by God that is more powerful to us than hope. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, peace, and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That was a key part of the promise for the Israelites. In captivity, they didn't see a future. They had missed it. God's plan was over is what they thought. The nation is going to cease to exist. Jeremiah said, I got word from God. God's got you. You've got a future. It's not over. God still has a plan for you and this nation. God not only gives you hope, he gives you a future. You can still be and do everything he ever planned for you to be. His plan isn't just to rescue you from your current situation. His plan is for you to make a difference and be used by him. His plan is for you to be the hope that that teacher was to that child. It's not over. Your life, your usability, your calling, your walk, the difference, it's not over. It may look like it's over. It may feel like it's over. You have a future that is greater than your past and greater than your present. God has plans for you that include a future that is greater. 
Even if you've wandered off from God's plan, I'm, I, this promise I say, I have a plan for you. I still have a plan for you. I have plans for you always. I love you always, and I still love you. I've never stopped loving you, and I'll never stop pushing plans for you. I was well into the age where people should be saving for retirement when my life transformed. It is not too late. One of the men that taught me going through discipleship and, and rehab and all that was almost twice my age now. I mean, he was, and he was only a few years into walking with Christ and transformed his life, not twice. That's, I forget I'm getting into the force now. Uh, I mean, he was 60 something and, and barely could move, but had transformed his life and was part of the hope that God had sent for me. It's not too late. How many of you knew that you had a call on your life? Doesn't have to be for ministry. It could have been, like I said, to make popcorn. But you knew God called you to it. You knew it was your destiny and something happened along the way and plans got mixed up and messed up. You still have that ability in you. God placed that ability in you, and it's never been taken away. You just walked away from the plan. You are anointed. You are anointed to do things in a way the world's not familiar with, all for the glory of God. And God has that plan for you to do them. I, I pray that next week we are open and able to, to have everyone come to church nationwide. I don't know if that's going to be the case. Uh, I know things are starting to open up slowly, but I still say for each household, you make your decision. Heads of household, you make your decisions. And yes, the church isn't just a building, but let's not lie to ourselves and say the church is a computer either. The church is a people, and the church has to assemble. Okay? The church assembles because we share hope with one another. So we can justify all day long by saying the church isn't a building, but it's not a computer either. So let's thank God that we're at the end of this thing and pretty soon we can come together as a body and celebrate a victory together. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for promises and blessings and hope beyond hope beyond hope that there are still plans for us, there's a future for us, there's a hope for us, and there's a peace. It's a prosperity peace. That's what it is. We are rich with peace, God. And there's not a date that's a cutoff time in our lives, but when the moment when we say, okay, God, I'm done doing it my way, I'm ready. I want to do this thing your way. I give you all of me. I give you everything I am. Make me what you will. And then we are anointed to do things that the world is not familiar with in a way the world is not familiar with, all for the glory of God. May it be so, may it be known, and may it be written upon the hearts of those hearing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.